Perfect. Thank you very much, Peter. So yes, um, as Peter mentioned, um, Fairfleet is taking or was was um, given the contract, awarded the contract for unmanned operations within the Copernicus Emergency Management Service and the Rapid, rapid Mapping. Um, what is the framework contract about? I'll give a very quick introduction to that. Um, so the key facts are a creation of a European Union wide so within all member states um, drone operator network. Um, in general, I think it's very important to mention really quick um, or history. So Fairfit is a drone service provider offering drone powered solutions um, to companies globally. And we have more than 3000 drone pilots, professional drone pilots in um, more than 90 countries. We have been operating uh, since um, 2016 actually. Um, the company was founded in 2018 and um, we have done more than 10,000 operations globally. Um, of course, all of them uh, legally, and it's uh, actually one of the hardest things to conduct these flights legally. So one essential part was the creation of a drone operator network. And um, I think we had a, or we have a very good base already. Um, we have created that. I will come to the current status of the operator network uh, in a bit. Um, we also build, or we already have a um, GIS tool where you can locate um, the closest pilot. And um, part of the framework contract is collecting data of areas up to 20 square kilometers per day um, and create auto mosaics and digital surface models uh, with a ground sampling distance on a resolution of uh, less than five centimeters per pixel. And for that, we will be using RTK, PPK, uh, technologies or GCPs in case um, that is sufficient. On the image on the right, um, you can see the difference between, let's say, best case satellite imagery of uh, roughly 30 centimeters per pixel GST and five centimeters. So you can see that the resolution of the picture is way higher, and especially when you are concerned about uh, high details, high accuracy, um, the results are mostly better. One important thing, of course, is um, a very quick turnover time. Uh, we understand that um, data delivery is um, paramount. Therefore, um, we have built a, a full processing queue um, just for the Copernicus uh, program where we, we can um, process data uh, very quickly once the data is collected. So let's speak real quick about the drone pilot network. Um, we need specialized equipment as part of the contract um, is that we fly up to 20 square kilometers a day. We will be using um, fixed wing drones. Um, there's different manufacturers in Europe uh, that produce very nice and very um, powerful drone systems um, that are perfectly for that use case. Um, and we can also use commercial multicopters um, with the technologies on board, but we wouldn't use them for areas that are larger than 10 square kilometers um, per day. Um, so our pilots need special equipment, and therefore we have to check uh, if they fulfill all the requirements. We go through extensive and uh, special training with these pilots, um, and um, yeah, we will uh, we will prepare the pilots according um, to the coordination and the discussions we will have with the national authorities. So the current status um, of let's say specialized, verified, trained um, Copernicus pilots, um, we have a pretty Good availability already. Um, we um, have, yeah, I would say more than uh, 40 pilots and very good coverage in Austria, Germany, Belgium, Denmark, Hungary, Italy, Romania, Portugal. Um, I think Ireland is also pretty well. Um, Malta, we have a very a few good pilots, but I think um, what is very, very important as a target for us is to have roughly 100 um qualified pilots uh, until the end of this year within all the member states um so to have at least one in every member state but we want to have as many as possible so that we can um use a or deploy a local pilot um to the to the area um, which will allow us to be there very quickly to capture the data as quick as possible and then also to upload and process the data as quick as possible. So our current focus here is um, to to build up a network uh, where we do not have extensive um, coverage yet. We're, we're working on it. 
One essential part is the flight authorizations. Uh, as you might know, drone flights are uh, heavily regulated. Um, there is a, let's say, a, a um, special phrase in the within the European regulation that says that state flights, so everything that is um, more or less um, activated by a national authority, um, do not have to obey to all laws, uh, all national um, flight restrictions. Um, and therefore, we need to work together with uh, national authorities um, to coordinate the flights, especially in disaster situations. I think it's very important um, as search and rescue has, is the highest priority. But once that is done, we try to get a slot to fly and capture data as soon as possible, as this is of, in the interest of all members. Right. So this is the general uh, situation. Uh, we have that um, authority flight rule. Um, that is in accordance with the European regulation. However, we need to coordinate with the Copernicus focal point. In most cases, it's civil protection, Ministry of Interior, or um, any kind of fire brigades. Um, we have to coordinate with the national aviation authorities in some cases, um, or with other national authorities. Um, there is, like, as an example, special requirements in Sweden that we figured out. So we have to um, see how we can. Um, especially for the export of drone data. So we have to figure out uh, how we can get that done very quickly uh, because normally there's a formal review process, but we're trying to figure out if there's any case to avoid that as this will take uh, currently 55 work five working days to review raw data. And I think this is not in the interest of uh, everyone at Copernicus. So this from our side, um, of course, um, it's, it's a bit challenging um, uh, for us um, discussing and coordinating with uh, all you or um, member state authorities. Um, but to be honest, uh, we have had uh, very good discussions with uh, the, the countries that we that we spoke with. Um, they were very helpful uh, um, in these discussions. And um, I would say the current status of the of the authorization is that um, we are ready uh, to fly in Germany, Italy, Portugal, Romania, and uh, Malta for now. Uh, we're also working on getting that done, achieving this as soon as possible with the other member states. So in case um, someone is here uh, who can support in, in their national um, country at, at the national authority, um, I would we'll be very happy if we could coordinate. And um, yeah, why, why do we coordinate? I think that's very important um, is because without a coordination upfront, the coordination in a case of a disaster will take uh, very much longer and um, everyone will be overwhelmed um, with the information and so i think preparing is is key um to to make sure that the delivery times um, are as fast as possible so from our operational process um we will receive the activation form um by the by the um by the copernicus um and we will go through um the entire operational process so we will pre-plan um, the flight in our system will take care of all the approvals and the pilot sourcing. Um, the flight execution where we will monitor the pilot and um, in some cases we will have to update the pilot with some uh, coordination so we have to maybe change flight maps and then we will take care of the data processing and we'll push the data back to the Copernicus program directly through our platform. This is, looks very uh, difficult, but these are all the steps within the process that we will have to, take, uh, have to go through. Um, if there is any interest in specific points, I'm very happy to, to discuss them um, and to provide more information on that. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Alexander. Um, I would just like uh, one minute more to compliment uh, the unmanned. So we have also the mans. Um, which is a consortium of CGR Parma and Eurosense uh, Belfotop, together with the three, four other um, major companies. I mean, this is very mature market segment. This is about photogrammetric uh, workflows, airplanes, and so forth. We are able to cover 26 uh, EU countries plus Norway. And what we are delivering uh, is uh, orthorectified imagery uh, with 10 to 20 centimeters up to 625 square kilometers. Uh, uh, also, LIDAR, uh, one to two points per square meter, uh, up to 625 square kilometers as well, and eight to 10 points uh, LIDAR plus ortho combined, 15 centimeter up to 100 
And this is really an excellent uh, tool, for example, for earthquake affected areas. Um, I don't want to spend more time because we, we are already over our time limit. So I give the floor back to, um, to um, uh, Jean-Francois. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Peter and, uh, and Alessander. A really interesting presentation. But indeed, it's time to move to the next one. So the next one is about exposure mapping. Um, and it will be about the first global human settlement release under Copernicus. And the speaker is uh, my colleague, uh, Thomas Kamper. And uh, Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Can you confirm that you see my, my slides full screen? Yes. Yes, okay. perfectly. Thank you very much. Yes, um, maybe you remember last year's uh, meeting where we were introduced as, as the new kid of the block, as uh, Peter also mentioned. Uh, uh, in the previous uh, presentation, so the, the exposure mapping service. And uh, I'm very happy to present to you um, the, the first release of uh, global human settlement layer data in the context of Copernicus that we were launching in uh, June this year. And I'll give you a, a quick overview of, of uh, the data that is in this new data release. But uh, before doing that, uh, a quick uh, step back. Again, this is bit of repetition of uh, what Peter already presented. So we are here with the exposure mapping component, providing information about exposed uh, population, uh, housing and other assets. That is of course uh, fundamental in, in any phase of uh, the crisis because we need to know how many people are affected uh, by, by a flood, how many houses are underwater uh, to stick with the, the flood example. Um, so that is that is a crucial uh, part and uh, population is, is very mobile. So we need to also have uh, very, very uh, much updated information on that. And this is what we are trying to provide with the uh, exposure mapping data of the global human settlement lake. Um, the DHSL data are not uh, new, so we started already in, in 2016, and there we, we had really a continuous evolution, also taking stock of the developments of Copernicus. So as soon as the we started off with, with Landsat, but as soon as the first uh, um, radar data of Sentinel-1 came up, we, we used that to improve our data um, with, with the Landsat data. Um, and then in 2020, also adding uh, first experiments on the Sentinel-2 uh, built-up uh, mapping in this, this picture. But this year, we, we were then able to, to really combine all the data that we have on the past uh, from the Landsat archives so 1975 until uh, uh, 20, 2014 with the, the new Sentinel data uh, of uh, 20. Um, 2020 that we were, were using here. And uh, that, that is uh, the focus of this presentation, but I would already uh, point out that uh, this is only the beginning. So, so now we are really moving into the operational production and there will be re regular updates on uh, exposure coming up. Um, you will hear more details on this in uh, tomorrow's uh, presentation uh, towards the end. So let's go directly into the, the GHSL data. Uh, you see here um, the, the area of um, two countries, uh, the Republic of Congo and the Democratic Republic of Congo with, with the twin cities of Brazzaville on one side of the Congo River and uh, Kinshasa on the other, so, other side. I have chosen this example because this, this river is nice, but also because uh, it, it should uh, show that we are really providing information at global level. So what I show you here is really uh, available uh, everywhere um, on the globe. You see here the uh, information that we were able to derive with the Landsat data, with the latest release of uh, GHSL in 2019. Uh, that is 30 meter resolution. Then adding uh, the Sentinel data, we can go much further. So we, we, we see a much better uh, extend of, of uh, both cities. Uh, also, if you look into the rural areas, you see that, that basically we were not able to map uh, in, in very difficult uh, environmental conditions. Uh, I must say also uh, the, the smaller towns and, and villages surrounding uh, the, the capitals. But that's, of course, very important for, for crisis management. You need to know uh, where everybody is, not only the, the big uh, capitals where you know already. And the second point I would stress is also that uh, due to the, the 
um, higher spatial resolution and improved also methodologies, we are able to really uh, go much further. So we don't only tell if an area is built up, but we can also really estimate the surface of built up. And you see this in the different uh, uh, color shades there uh, with, with uh, very much very high densities than, than in the city center. Um, we were also experimenting uh, with, with other data to, to come up with, with the, the next level because uh, building footprints is one information, but uh, we, we need to also understand what type of building are we looking at. Um, is it a, is it a one-story building? Is it a, a family block or even a skyscraper? In the past releases, we were not able to do this. Now we also provide really built up uh, volume information that is then quite important also for, for the next step of the population disaggregation. Um, but one, one other aspect is also uh, that we, we are able to, to differentiate more the, the type of, of settlement uh, we, we are looking at. So uh, is it is it a, a very dense uh, built up area? Is it uh, high rise, is it low rise? But also is, has it vegetation? Um, and is it a residential or non-residential information? All this information uh, is now globally available and can then inform also the population disaggregation. So we can really then distribute uh, the population only into the residential uh, buildings um, because that is the, the, the aim of uh, the, the census. So we are using the census data that are residential population. So we don't want to put uh, people into industrial or commercial complexes. And also having high rise buildings that are marked as residential, we would uh, have more people in this. And the final product uh, then is also this uh, degree of urbanization that classifies all the settlements uh, with, a, with a uniform definition into um, cities, towns, and uh, rural areas. So this data is available now on our website. Um, here, just a quick summary. Uh, so we, we have uh, an extended time frame with the new data. So we, we go from 1975 until today, 2020 is uh, the latest data, but we also do a forecast into the future. So uh, we, we go until 2030 now in five years interval. So you get a much more stable time series than what we had in the past, where we had uh, occasional updates based on availability of uh, Landsat data. Then the, the spatial resolution I mentioned already, we improved from 30 meter uh, for the built up uh, to 10 meter spatial resolution and also the population grids improved from uh, 250 meter to 100 meter. And then uh, also quite, quite interesting, possibly also for, for other applications beyond just uh, the population uh, disaggregation that we are using it for is the classification of uh, global residential and non-residential areas. And uh, the last point uh, I want to mention here the building height information at 100 meter spatial resolution. If you want more details, uh, please go to our website, ghsl.jsc.europa.eu, where you can find all the details, but also on the landing page of uh, the Copernicus services, we are now integrated and you will be guided to the GHSL data page. And uh, I think I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh... Very interesting presentation. I think that uh, people will enjoy the, the new version of uh, the global human settlement layer. Um, it's time now to move to the next session uh, because we are a bit late. Um, the next session is about uh, the next session. The next presentation, sorry, is about the the, uh, the update of on the European Forest uh, Fire Information System application. And my colleague uh, Jesus San Miguel uh, is a speaker for this presentation. So, um, Jesus, this uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jan Francois. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here again. Providing you with an update of the new developments in the European Forest Fire Information System. Let me just be sure that we are using this uh, slideshow. <laughs> this is um, a short presentation on some of the applications that probably uh, most users have not really seen in the European Forest Fire Information System because they have not been implemented in, in the front end of the system, but they were there and they provide information that is very useful for many users. 
for that, uh, I come back to uh, the introduction of the different systems that was provided by Peter. And she mentioned that the ESIS was built uh, with the support of what is called the expert group on forest fires, mainly coordinated by the environment, which was the civil protection service of the European Commission at that time. But the, the point here is that there were many applications that were not directly connected to emergency. They were connected to the monitoring of fires, uh, events that happen every year. So, um, unfortunately, they're happening more and more uh, in the latest years. So, today I will present a short introduction to some of the uh, tools that we are developing in relation to some of the applications that were foreseen in NOTIS. As you can see in NOTIS, the idea is to cover the full cycle, sorry, the full cycle of the fire starting before the fire occurs, providing fire danger forecast, then we have fire events, we monitor in real time active fire detection, and we have planetary maps, land cover planet assessment, and those are the applications that have been really most developed in the latest year, in the last years and that are most used by most users. But then there were other applications such as uh, emissions assessment, <coughs> which has become really relevant, potential soil losses, regeneration of vegetation that were used by environmental users, but not really, there is no need to have a, a real time information on those. And those are the ones that we will present today, which we aim to incorporate into the system in the, in the coming years. One is related to fire danger uh, forecast. And the graphs that you have here uh, are now in what is called the ethics statistics portal. Well, at least they, they, are, they will be there, they are not there yet. And what you see in the, center, in the center of the slide is the monitoring of the fire danger along the days of the year. And then the plotting is that we are doing is on a weekly basis. That allows the, the fire managers to know what the situation is if they are above the average, if they are above the maximum fire danger that has been reached in the country, if they are really under a, an extreme situation or not. On the right hand side, what we have is the cumulative graph of the same data. And here we use the daily separate rating, which is the transformation of the fire weather index. In any case, what the index provides is the uh, the probability that a fire that occurs will spread very quickly and will become a very large fire, which is very important. And these graphs were used, for instance, in the analytical grid that we compiled with our colleagues in DGECO. In preparation for the meeting, DGECO had a, with the ministers of the civil protection of the member states to discuss the potential modification of the union civil protection mechanism which is now proposed by the Commission. And below you have the text of this, um, of this uh, activation. Uh, this type of information that is very relevant, it was not available in the system and it will be included. What we had in notice was the map of the fire danger in the different locations. But this is, these are data that are used by fire managers and will be shortly incorporated into the system. As I say, within the statistics portal. And something that is also important, as I mentioned, is the, the emissions. Emissions are clearly emissions from forest fires contribute, and in some cases are a, a very important contribution to the global emissions uh, by a given country. For instance, in critical years, like in Portugal in 2003 or five, or in Greece in 2007. The emissions provided by biomass burning, by wildfires, were very relevant. Okay? This type of information was not available in NEFIS and now it is in place. As you see, we have been incorporating new uh, tools and applications into the system. What we provide in the F statistics portal is the evolution of emissions coming from forest fires uh, throughout the year. From the beginning of this year, these are data for this year, uh, until the end of the year, and we compare those to the data between 2003 and 2021. The data are uh, currently coming from a system that is called Global Fire Assimilation System that is uh, operated by the CAMS, Copernicus Service, which is, uh, shows here the synergy between the Copernicus Service that was also mentioned in the, in the environment of the Copernicus ecosystem. 
Another application that we are currently developing, we have already developed it in the country profiles in the global system, but it's not there in EFIS, is the estimation of emissions depending on the length of the pipe. Uh, clearly, the higher the amount of biomass, the higher the emissions emitted by the wildfire. But then the, the difference in which the computation of emissions is done is very important. The methodology that we are implementing here is the one that is used by countries to report to the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I mean, it's very important in Europe and it's also very important at the global scale because this is the, me the methodology that is used by many countries to compute the emissions that they are having from forest fires uh, on an annual basis and the reporting they do to the to the IPCC. Uh, below you have the publication that was just uh, launched on the contribution of this type of emissions to EFTA, which is a global database of uh, anthropogenic and, in this case, biomass emissions. And finally, a fourth application that is included in the service, or will be included in the service, is the estimation of potential soil loss. This application was in EFIS um, conceptually from the beginning. And we were computing the amount of tons of soil that are lost after forest fires. Uh, it uses a, a model that's called Kuzlen, the revised uh, universal soil loss equation. And what we do in this application is the removal of vegetation uh, after the fire. Uh, the removal of vegetation here is just um, we either have the vegetation or we don't have the vegetation. So the lower bound provides the actual. Uh, Erosion, if fires were not occurring, and the top one, the total erosion, if the total vegetation was removed. And there is obviously something in between. And that is what we are estimating using what is called fire severity, that provides a, a, us with a gradient of the damage that is produced by the fire. And this is something that we are computing, and we thought that it was about time to have it online and provide this type of information to the user. So that will soon become one of the tools in EFIS. And finally, something that is not a real-time application, but is a, an important application, is the classification of uh, the European territory in wildfire risk areas. Uh, there is uh, an online application that is called uh, EFIS Wildfire Risk Assessment, in, the, in which you have a specific viewer uh, that depicts the raw result of the fire risk in terms of uh, high risk areas, medium risk areas, and low risk areas, and then all the components that are included in the model, plus the description of the model that is used. Below you have the, the reference to the publication of this, uh, this type of uh, risk analysis. And this is something that, we, that has been pending for many years. It came out uh, finally because the European Court of Auditors called the Commission to have an independent tool to assess wildfire risk in the European territory. And then the GRC, in collaboration with other PGs of the Commission, has implemented this, uh, this application that would be used, uh, I think, uh, by a lot of uh, Commission services for planning and at the level of the member states, also for planning into the areas that are at high risk. Uh, this was not only developed by the Commission, but this was developed with the support of the expert group on forest fires. That is the fire managers of the fire administrations in the countries, which is now made of uh, 43 countries in the Pan-European territory. I think with this, I will close my presentation. You have additional information in ethics if you want to uh, link into the viewers or recall uh, additional information on the methodology. Thank you. Back to you. Excellent. Thanks a lot, uh, Jesus. And you are just in time. So congratulations. Perfectly 10 minutes. No, no. Uh, no, excellent. So we will uh, come with the question a bit later. So now we will continue with the next presentation. Uh, my colleague, uh, Alfred de Jäger, will may provide you an update on the Urban and Global uh, Drought Observatory. So, Alfred, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you. For having me on this uh, meeting. If you uh, short overview of the droughts, I think most of you experienced the droughts also this year. 
Um, basically, in the end of July, Europe was almost fully in the, under drought. Only Lithuania didn't experience uh, a phenomena on, on drought. There were issues with the water supply, um, especially in northern Italy. There were communes that uh, could not provide water ho the whole day. There were issues in the Netherlands with dike stability. You must imagine a dike uh, is built of clay in part, clay cracks if it dries too out, out too much. So basically the drought <laughs> can create uh, a base for a flood once it starts raining again. There were issues with the river transport, uh, mainly on the Rhine. The Rhine is very interesting. It's uh, a river that flows through whole Germany and that creates one of the, that was cleared now, creates one of the competitive advantages of the German industry. Because if you have a, a ship bringing the goods, it's about 200 trucks. Those ships could not uh, sail this uh, summer for a large part, so that had large repercussions on the German industry. The energy sector was um, also affected by this big drought. Um, nice example is the nuclear power in France. Uh, there are rules on the discharge of uh, water on back to the river. If the, there is not enough water in the river and the water is too hot, then the ecosystem will be damaged and it's forbidden then to discharge your outflow. That counts also for fossil fuel gas turbines. Uh, so the energy sector was also heavily affected by these uh, droughts. <laughs> the ecosystem damage is a more complex phenomenon because we don't have a lot of monitoring on that. I will come back to that <laughs> later also. In the agriculture sector, there were a lot of impacts as well. Interesting is, for example, the rice that uh, we predicted already uh, at the end of the winter that there was not enough water in northern Italy. So a lot of farmers decided not to sow even the rice. Okay. Uh, on the other lot of crops, there was still some harvest thanks to some rain that fall in spring. So the, the picture of the agriculture, I think we will assess only after this season, after now that everything is harvested. If we go back to the low flow index uh, that is computed with list flood, uh, it's a kind of uh, negative list flood. So if you have, if you can predict the flood, you can also predict the outflow and uh, the, the, let's say the anomaly of the outflow. Uh, if there is uh, not enough water in the system, so list flood gives us the, the, the mapping of uh, the areas of low flow. And we can overlay that also with the data that we receive from the International Committee of the Rhine that you see on the right picture. And there you see this uh, large impact on the Rhine again. But what we do a lot in Edo is we integrate local data with the European overview. And we start to do that also with GDO. If you now think that the drought is over after some rain, which of course is the feeling for a lot of people, then you have to look into the subsoil, in the groundwater, where you see that there is still a large deficit. For example, this is uh, on the outflow of the Po River. It's a protected area of the Ramsar Convention. It's a wetland. And what you see is that the rain uh, get some impact at the end of the of this month in September. So there was some rain, but basically the bars are still in red and completely dry. You can see that with the SPI uh, 48 and the SPI 12 maps, but you can also see the deficit that we compute, which is in the order of uh, 40%. So it means that 40% of the rain that we expect didn't fall. And that, of course, has heavy percussions in the long term on the groundwater. Now, if we go through the world, then Europe was not the only place with a lot of drought. We have a similar type of drought that I was just explaining you in Eastern Africa. So the, the drought is a kind of continuation of uh, rainy seasons that fail. So there is rain. The world is green. 
but it's all the time not enough. <laughs> so you get a, a long-term deficit. This afternoon, Viola Ocienio from uh, the ICPAC organization with whom we collaborate will tell you more about uh, the big droughts in East Africa. Uh, a drought that was a bit similar that we had in China, was a bit similar like we had in Europe, it was exacerbated by heat waves. <laughs> this year we integrated the world heat waves into the GDO system, so you can now follow heat waves over the whole planet. These are climatic heat waves that we <coughs> display there, so it's also, you can also have a heat wave in winter, which of course have, have big repercussions on the ecosystems. But this heat wave in China was exacerbating the drought that we had already in the area. Also there, we don't know yet too much on the impacts. We try to get those kind of data. Um, and of course, little by little, the statistics of China on the impact of this drought will come up. Another drought that is very long lasting is in Southern South America, on which we already re uh, published reports uh, last year, also together with the local organizations over there. Um, this drought is affecting Paraguay, also a big nature reserve over there, uh, and northern Argentina especially. It has also large repercussions on the hydropower in the Paraná dumps that is affecting Uruguay and northern Argentina. All these droughts, because they are quite complex and there's a lot of factors always uh, creating specific issues for a drought, we, we publish in reports in, in which we summarize all the maps that you can also generate on ADO and GDO. So it's, and it gives you a kind of narrative of what is happening in the, in the area. So we started with the drought in the Western Mediterranean that then exacerbated into Northern Italy, mainly uh, caused in spring by the lack of snow that we had in the Alps, which was also, of course, uh, creating the <laughs> effects on the Rhine later on in the season. Then we made a, a report on the drought in Europe. It didn't finish, so we had to make another one. We made a report on the drought in East Africa, again on Europe. The specific situation in the Netherlands is also explained in one of our reports, uh, and which is of course quite weird, by the way, because the, the drought in the Netherlands is exacerbated by modern agricultural practices, in which they drain a lot of the land in spring to go onto the land with heavy machinery, and of course then once you have drained your plain, you have lost your water for good into the sea. Uh, the drought in China is, ex is explained in the last report. <laughs> the new things that we made this year is a kind of new combined index. The combined index is integrating all kinds of drought data that are confirming each other. It's the SPI, which is a, um, which is a common known indicator that is based basically on the rainfall that is falling. We have the soil moisture that we get out of the list flood model. And we have the FAPA, which is a satellite product. Now, the FAPA product is not working in winter for Northern Europe because there's not enough light. But that component we still have to integrate in the system. But for the rest, you can now follow an updated combined road indicator, which uh, incorporates better the history of the road into the system. Because once, like I tried to explain already, once it starts raining, it doesn't mean that the drought is finished for some specific aspects of the drought. Another thing that we are working on, that you can see that quickly now, is a responsive web mapping. So we will make a more powerful system that you can also use the drought system on your tablet or your, your smartphone. Um, the impacts that I was talking about already are very complex to assess with droughts because they are uh, both not connected in time and you can have the impact much later and they can also not be connected in space. Uh, so you had an impact in the Netherlands because of a drought on the Rhine that was in the end caused by lack of snow and heat in Switzerland. So um, in order to 
understand that better and to automate those processes, there is a, a project called Edora, in which they use especially artificial intelligence to improve on that. And that is uh, the short overview I wanted to give you. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to some rainbows. Thank you very much, Alfred. A really interesting and scary presentation, by the way. Um, but thanks for that. I think that uh, people will enjoy to, to read all the, the report that you referred to and to, to play a bit with all the tools and information that you deliver. Um, we are a bit short in time, so I will immediately move to the last but not least uh, presentation about uh, the global flood monitoring. And the speaker is uh, Ms. Dragna uh, Milikovic. Uh, from the Earth Observation Data Center for Water Resource uh, Management. Uh, so, Ragna, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you just confirm that my screen is visible? We can see the screen. Okay, yes. No, it's perfect. Yes, we have it in okay, full screen. Excellent. Just a second. I will do my best to, to keep uh, the presentation just in time. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dragana Milinkovic, and I have the honor to present you the Global Flood Monitoring Product. And before I start, I just want to click, uh, quickly congratulate to the whole army of people behind Copernicus Man uh, Emergency Management Service for the amazing and significant milestone that was reached. And keep the excellent work on our team, including. So, uh, Global Flood Monitoring Product is a relatively new component to the service. And uh, the motivation behind it uh, was that there were uh, it, some gaps were identified in the existing response to the uh, of flood uh, identification. So uh, GFM, a short uh, abbreviation of Global Flood Monitoring, uh, is a component that is a global near real time flood monitoring system that is based on the Copernicus uh, Sentinel-1 star mission. Uh, features that are important to be mentioned here is that this service is a fully automatic and provides continuous flood monitoring. Uh, uh, flood monitoring, yeah. Uh, because it relies on the star, it uh, star, uh, features enable us all day, all weather con conditions monitoring. Uh, fact that is a near real time flood uh, map provision uh, means that uh, within eight hours from the Sentinel-1 data acquisition, we can uh, provide the products to the users. A thematic accuracy that we use and uh, aim for is uh, more than 70 to 80% of critical su success index. And the spatial resolution that we rely on is 20 meters. Already mentioned, it's a uh, very complete, uh, complete spatial coverage, so it's a global product. Uh, it has various data interfaces, 11 product outputs that I will uh, mention uh, later on. And in the future, we expect to have one new feature added, which is a historic data availability, so-called global flood archive that will start from 2015 onwards. What is the approach that we use in the global flood monitoring service? So we rely on three independent flood monitoring algorithms that are run in parallel. Uh, these uh, three independent flood monitoring algorithms are generating two outputs. I'm briefly said. So there are three flood extents and also three associated likelihoods of flood detection. Likelihood in this context, uh, context means confidence of flood detection. These results are coming into ensemble algorithm that at the end has a, a single output of a combined flood uh, extent that is based on majority voting. And of course, a combined average uh, uh, likelihood of flood detection. The example below uh, depicts uh, the case, I believe this is, uh, yes, this is a flooding case flooding case in Australia that happened earlier this year. So the first image uh, represents a Sentinel-1 scene prior to event. Then we have a Sentinel-1 scene that uh, is uh, taken uh, in the course of flooding event and the black uh, parts are indicating 
uh, potential uh, flooding areas. And by using our, our service, we were able to identify uh, as an ensemble flood uh, output uh, the, the blue areas that were mapped as a flooded areas. So three algorithms that were mentioned before, uh, reasons for using this kind of approach is actually that we want to increase the robustness of the system. So we rely on the uh, scientifically proven approach from DLR, TUV, and LIST. Uh, DLR approach uh, for flood detection is based on a fuzzy logic model for water classification. In case of TUV, uh, we uh, we TUV algorithm relies on data cube solution, which is a system to geocode, read, and store Sentinel-1 star satellite images, and harmonic model that is built out of Sentinel-1 scenes actually help us to to the identified floods, which uh, flood where flood represents a deviation from the harmonic mean. And in the case of least algorithm, uh, the main approach here, uh, the, the algorithm works on the uh, change detection approach uh, and requires a, a Sentinel-1 scene that has an earlier timestamp so that this change can be identified. The results from these three, as mentioned before, are coming into the flood ensemble and the uh, combined result is actually a single product that is visible to the user. What kind of product GFM service is uh, providing to its users? So we have in total 11 products, uh, 11 layers that can be uh, visualized. Uh, we have grouped them in four thematic groups. So flood, uh, sorry, water observation, uh, Sentinel-1 related uh, data products, contextual information for better interpretation of the given results, and the rapid impact assessment products. Moving on, I would be focusing only on two uh, product groups to, to uh, give you just a briefly uh, more details on this. So the uh, water observation products are observed flood extent, which is, as mentioned before, ensemble flood uh, extent product from three input algorithms. Reference water mask, which is based on the water algorithm of DLR and LIST, and it represents a uh, permanent and seasonal water bodies. And finally, we have the Sentinel-1 observed water extent, which is actually a union of observed flood extent and uh, Sentinel-1 reference water mask. Uh, to depict uh, how the product is looking like, a flooding case in Pakistan is used, uh, and the extent is quite obvious of, of this event catastrophic event. Uh, the next product group that I would like to focus on is actually a contextual information that is critical to be used to interpret the results. And those uh, layers are called exclusion mask, likelihood values, and advisory flags. So exclusion mask is used uh, to, um, to classify actually unclassified areas like urban areas, dense vegetation, areas, sandy surfaces, uh, regions with topographic effects. On the other uh, side, as mentioned before, likelihood values actually indicate the confidence of the classification. And finally, advisory flags uh, shall be used as an indicator where the potential quality reduction of the mapping can be expected due to for example, meteorological conditions or degraded input data. Uh, one more example here is the earlier, earlier mentioned the case in Australia. So you can see the raw uh, scenes from the Sentinel-1 and uh, the location of the flooding event and how GFM is actually depicting uh, the identified detected event. How you can uh, access and see uh, the output layer. So uh, product dissemination and the user entry points have various options for the users. 
and uh, authentication uh, process is actually quite user friendly, I would say, because with only one login, all components and functionalities can be accessed easily. And for the time being, uh, the, the most mostly used options are Globus interface as well as uh, as well as GFM web application. And soon to come, uh, we will be integrated in EFAS as well. Uh, important thing to mention is also the team behind this service. So uh, together with GRC, our consortium uh, led by uh, Earth Observation Data Center from Austria, Geoville, Technical University of Vienna, DLR, LIST and CHIMA, that is the team that actually made this uh, service possible. That would be all that I have for today. I invite uh, all to um, make their accounts, to play with the product, visit our wiki page as well. And in case there are more questions, we will be happy to support you via GFM user support service. Thank you so much.